And so next, our wonderful speaker, Melissa, um, Rosemary, I'm sorry, will be coming to the stage. And so Rosemary Mazir is the product manager at Zero, and you know her talk this afternoon is on the confessions of our product geek. And so she'll be talking a lot about her first um, API and what we can learn from that. And so Rosemary, will you please come to the stage? And please share your slides when you're ready. You're muted, I believe. Hi, Shen, are you able to see the slides now? Not yet. Yes, your slides are up now and they, I think we All just good? lost you again. Yes, now it's in presentation yeah. mode and it's good to go. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Thank you, Shelley. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Rosemary um, from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I work in product with Xero, uh, which is a cloud accounting software company headquartered in New Zealand. Um, and I look after various uh, global initiatives, primarily uh, looking after API integration. Um, and I thought, why not um, share the experiences uh, that I've had? Um, going back to my uh, software engineering days uh, back in India, where I was working on web services and then eventually uh, moved into the API space um, and most recently in the product space. And uh, during the course of time, I have learned a lot uh, through my own mistakes and also made a lot of observations with my, uh, from my peers who've also worked in the same industry. And um, here I am um, to share with you all the learnings that I've had. To give you a bit of a, a background as to where I come from, I have worked in the engineering space and then I did a little bit of research um, in speech recognition systems and search engines. And then I thought, okay, I'll move back again. And I started um, in moving into the application development space um, with various different companies, uh, primarily in startups, um, and then uh, moved into the product space. Now, the reason that I'm uh, telling you this is you've seen that I've worked in a varied uh, set of fields and domains, and I've observed a lot in the process side, product side, and engineering side. And uh, that's the reason um, for me to be here and share with you some of the myths and anti-patterns that I have observed uh, in product, process, and design. So today, if you are uh, beginning that journey um, to the world of APIs, um, or if you've still not written your first API, your first endpoint, you are in the right place. Um, and so I would be sharing with you um, the right, you know, what you need to do, what you need to, what's the mindset that you need to have um, in order to, you know, um, pursue um, any type of uh, API product work. Without delay, I will jump in. Uh, the first anti-pattern, APIs are an afterthought. Um, so I think the, the way we've been working in the last few uh, years or decades is um, we have primarily been a very traditional type of business model type of companies that we've been working in, right? Where when I say traditional business model, you are looking at, uh, you know, um, building various capabilities to fulfill certain business needs. And so APIs have actually never crossed our mind at all. And um, that, that mindset is changing and we are becoming more um, aware. And that's where we start thinking of what can we do uh, about re, um, uh, re, uh, or thinking our strategy altogether, right? So um, you start looking at you know internal APIs, partner APIs, and external APIs. And um, you're now clueless as to where you want to begin. Now, let's look at just one part. Now, um, you might be uh, working on an application within your company, and maybe that new product would probably want um, another product team to expose that data. So look at it as um, building up an uh, internal API where you can expose that data. In the case of a partner API, you might already have an established relationship with an app partner. Right, and so you might want to start writing up a few endpoints or um, a new API just for them.
for a particular use case. And then the same holds true for you know, external APIs and public APIs. But this mentality is very different from companies like Twilio and Stripe, which are heavily API-led companies. They thrive on only APIs, they create and sell APIs, their revenue comes only from APIs, right? Now, traditional business model companies have to start thinking differently. To give you an example, I did work on a monolithic application. So we had a core offering, uh, a product which had many different offshoots. Each of them were their own products. And they were all very tightly coupled. That was the type of the architecture. Now, the core offering was had also exposed some of its uh, functionality as an API. And there came this use case which required one of the offshore products to also expose their functionality. Now, what we ended up doing is we started adding an additional endpoint to this existing API in order to uh, say satisfy this new uh, uh, partner. And the use cases started increasing and we started adding the next endpoint and the third and the fourth. But what is that the right way to move forward? No you're already having an existing problem of a very tightly coupled product, right? So problem one is you've got to decouple it. Problem two is you're adding to that chaos by adding more endpoints to an existing API. So that's where you've got to rethink of what your API strategy is got to look like. And when I say data driven, why I, I, I specify data is, so taking this very same example, uh, down the line, you might want to actually tap into the data potential. You might want to, you know, uh, monetize on data or any other assets. And that's where you've got to start thinking whether each of these have to be products by themselves. When I say product, you've got to think whether this is the right way to move forward when you are thinking about APIs. And that's the main reason for me to specify that APIs are your first class citizens. So what do you need? You need to ensure that when you are coming up with endpoints or your first API, you've got to have a mix of, you know, different uh, people in the uh, different stakeholders where you've got to think of not just only the business need, but you're also thinking of the technical side and the other way around. Now with that, which my, my second one is going to be linked um, to the previous. So this is another myth. APIs are uh, technical solutions, not products. Now, I'll give you an example. With most, most of the places that I worked in, and even myself, we always have this mentality that APIs are technical solutions, and why do we, why do we have that uh, mindset? First point, we, um, we connect uh, APIs with a developer, right? No UI, so we think, okay, it's a technical solution, right? There's, there's, those are the pr two primary reasons. It's a dev end user is, not uh, is a developer and there's no UI, so you're probably thinking it's technical. And so, which eventually leads to this thinking that it is not a product itself. But this has to change because we are looking at becoming a platform in times to come. And if you're going to be having technical solutions, for the, like similar to the example that I gave you previously, you will not uh, have that digital transformation. Right. So what would happen in the case um, where you start looking at APIs as technical solutions, they become very tightly coupled uh, to a use case. Right. And so this could uh, end up being um, uh, you might end up in a situation where these APIs will need to be deprecated. And I'm going to give you an example here. One of the companies that I worked for. Uh, we had a very strong base in a particular uh, region, and we were actually trying to um, uh, step into a new market. And we had an existing um, relationship um, with an app partner in the local region, and uh, we thought, okay, fine, they do have a, a firm footing in this new market, so we might want to leverage off their offerings. So we were considering a strategic partnership there, and. Um, we had years to go before we actually um, stepped into that new market. And so what happened in the interim was we started, uh, in order to keep the communication and uh, uh, the partnership going, we started uh, fulfilling small use cases, coming up with uh, you know, endpoints, um, which will um, you know, um, overcome certain pain points in um, the local region. 
Now, what happened to this was we really didn't do much research into uh, the problem. And so what happened, we didn't gain that much, uh, uh, we didn't have that much of a gain in the local market, as well as what happened in time to come, we were not able to also uh, get a firm footing in the new market because this particular app partner had a shrinking user base. So the biggest mistake that we made here is we rushed into it. So that was one problem. We never uh, foresaw that uh, if we um, start adding these new endpoints for this one app partner, would it be really worth it if we were to actually start having more app partners join us? And that became a big, bigger problem. And that's where we were like shuttered for low adoption and we, it became a throwaway API. So we had to deprecate APIs. So when you are thinking of um, APIs, you need to keep in mind that eventually you, you may start off testing um, an API or an endpoint with one uh, developer, but that may change over time. You're not going to build it for one. So never um, settle for anything short term. Um, always keep the long term uh, goal in mind. And in order to make that happen, uh, you need to ensure that you do have a good mix. So the product people have to wear a, a technical hat. And you know, um, the technical people also have got to look at the business side. And when I say business side, we need to keep in mind that the business needs are driven by the developer. So that all that thinking should also change. It's no longer the traditional end user or consumer, but the consumer here is the developer themselves. Now we'll 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 shift. We're going to be talking about um, agile. Now, in um, a typical software development, we say we want to be agile and we have different flavors of agile. Uh, but when it comes to API development, I have noticed that uh, we still have a waterfall approach. So when I say waterfall, you want to you know, define uh, uh, the API requirements, get the full contract, um, get into the design phase and the development phase, then the testing, and then you're out. You wait for this whole cycle, and that's typically a waterfall. But we never think that API development can also be um, iterated because innovation is key even when you are into this API space. And innovation demands agility, right? And agility will require you to have that collective uh, ownership. So you need to ensure that you bring um, everybody on on board. Um, so when I say everybody on board, you have different stakeholders here, right? You uh, might want to bring in your developers um, and engage with them early on rather than wait till the very end. So when I talk about um, uh, API first approach, I want to stress here that when you begin and when you write your first endpoint, you're always in the mindset that you need to get it right. You need to you know, have that contract well-defined and that's exactly uh, not the way to move forward. So you start, go with a very lightweight process, right? So you come up with a proof of concept, um, maybe write your own client. Um, and if it's an internal uh, API, you can also get that uh, uh, the team whom you're writing the API for to spin up a client um, and test it out themselves, right? And uh, the other good way to uh, do a bit of usability testing as well is do not give them any documentation. Uh, just observe and see how how they take uh, take it forward. So that's that's a very uh, low cost uh, option too. But now this would this method wouldn't work if you are looking at writing APIs like um, the ex public APIs or uh, the partner APIs. You, your process will change, obviously, because you're working with developers who are outside uh, your company. So you want to ensure you get it right, um, and in the best way, maintaining that communication as well. So bring about this uh, collaborative design uh, where you get to talk about, say, uh, what protocol to use, what words, what nouns, define you know the response codes, get everything, um, uh, you know, get everyone in the room and discuss those topics early on. Right, and this can be iterated. When it comes to say, once you've designed, uh, once you've defined the contract, and then you moved into 
you know, trying to start writing skeleton code, maybe keep iterating this. Then start talking about how you want to test it out. You might want to simulate the environment, or you might want to discuss about sandbox. So you can repeat the same um, conversations that you would have in traditional software product development, even when it comes to um, APIs. At the end of the day, you need to ensure that they do have uh, all the information that they need, and they should be able to self-serve them. And this would definitely come only if you have an agile and iterative way of uh, developing APIs. Okay, this uh, we move, it's still sticking to the process side, but this is an, uh, more of an anti-pattern. Now, we often think um, artificial intelligence and APIs are not complementary, um, but just like how we know artificial intelligence is applicable to any industry, um, which means even if there are APIs, you can still make use of artificial intelligence. And I'm going to give you an example of where you can use this. We start off with usage monitoring. So especially in uh, the finance field and the accounting field, so any compliance um, field, for us, it is very key. And I, I stress this because I've, I've been working in uh, VFSI and uh, most recently with Zero as well. So. It's very key uh, or important, critical for us to pick and choose who we integrate with. And um, we go through a lot of assessments. We, the developers have to um, go through security assessments, certification requirements, and this could come through various regulatory bodies. Um, like Australia does have, uh, you know, the t various different uh, tax organizations, finance organizations, who you have to get through step-by-step uh, step in order to actually integrate with them. Now this often, sometimes, can be a one-off uh, type of an assessment which you do before you get into a deal, a strategic partnership with this developer. And you get to know what their branding is, what their usage is going to be like, so you're well aware. But what happens, say, one year later? You can see that the usage starts changing. You might see, um, uh, if, if for, uh, for example, if we were expecting one million requests per 10 seconds and you're now seeing 1 million requests per second, that's a massive difference. But how do we know whether that is legitimate or not, right? So in this particular case, I've seen um, in a few different companies where the process is manual because they are now trying to actually assess to see whether this is, uh, uh, these are, are these legitimate requests? Because when I say legitimate, I don't mean where we go on the technical side, the development side, pull up the logs, that's not what I'm referring to. We start looking at reassessing this developer or the app partner all, we start the process again. So you'll get sales, marketing, dev evangelists, you know, going through the whole process of trying to see, is this app partner doing the right thing? Is it part of that business model to actually, well, what, you know, the, to uh, ensure that this is the right pattern that we see? This is manual. So to cut away this uh, manual element, you can start using artificial intelligence. And then I give, I've given an example as unsupervised learning clustering here, but that's where you start, we, for this particular example, we started um, categorizing different um, app partners, and then we started looking at the usage. So we started looking at the usage pattern for APIs. And um, we were able to start seeing patterns and clustering. And um, that's typically an example where you can start looking at how APIs are being used by de various different partners who have their apps classified in different categories, right? Um, now, intelligent traffic monitoring and security testing, I'll give you a, an example that will talk about both. We go through a lot of different um, uh, uh, testing uh, techniques and methods right throughout the life cycle, right? So we start with unit tests and then we end up right after production testing, but uh, which also includes security testing. But we need to keep in mind that not uh, there will be still gaps, um, and which is why we still have uh, um, you know hackers trying to hack into uh, various different systems too. Even though we have like we try and prevent DDoS attacks, we have VATs, we have uh, gateways which are checking your um, valid inputs, invalid inputs. We have uh, you know sessions, and we do a lot of uh, we take a lot of. Um, uh, Meta, meta controls and we put in a lot of uh, security controls to ensure that um, our APIs are safe uh, to consume. 
But there are still gaps, and these gaps can be uh, actually um, well understood if we have AI as a part of the security testing. So tools like Ping Intelligence will actually be able to tell you and analyze, say, this is your good traffic, this is your bad traffic, uh, or you might have some decoy APIs there. You're trying to then understand what traffic is being blocked, and this, this is constant learning. So you'll get to know what the anomalous behavior is like. So you start monitoring your traffic, you will start uh, trying to figure out and detect whether this is um, an anomalous behavior or if this is expected behavior. So always have AI in your mind when you're starting uh, writing your first API. Definitely, this is not the first step that you would do, but do not rule out the option. APIs are not user-centric, so we talk a lot about human design, human-centered design, user-centered design, but there's one fundamental problem here. When we start writing, um, working on APIs, we forget who our user is, and this happens even till today. We write stories um, with the end user in mind more than uh, we do not think our developer as our end user. Okay, So we do not have that empathy for uh, the developer as much as we might have for the end user. So you need to start changing that mindset too. So start investing in design. Um, when I say start investing in design, I, I to go back to the very same in, uh, example, when you're using internal APIs, it can be low cost, right? So you can do something very cheap and very quick and agile. Uh, get your um, internal developers involved in the process. See them actually use your APIs, get feedback. It can be very ad hoc. But when it comes to, say, uh, working on external partner APIs and you've got actually uh, more money to invest in the design phase, start thinking of different ways in which you can collaborate with them. Now, I mentioned about prototyping, testing, and validating. The same holds true for internal as well. But you need to start uh, looking at it from a different perspective. You are starting to add the next app developer and the next developer and the next developer, and you may not be able to manage this um, engagement with them. So that's where you've got to start thinking about portals and explorers, and you may not be able to invest even in a portal, uh, in an API management solution uh, 30 days, or let's say you're talking about documentation. Documentation is your UI. So you may not be able to have um, very sophisticated docs, but a postman collection should do. Right? Or maybe you might just have some sort of a internal UI that you came up with for your company. Maybe you can have, uh, you can help your developers by putting up some documentation there. So always think um, that you can help your developers self-serve. And that should be um, in your mind always. So do not alienate them. Get them involved, whether there is an outcome every sprint or not. Ensure that you keep that constant engagement with them going and never leave them alone. APIs are cruddy. Okay, often we think APIs are all about REST. And so when you think about REST, and this happens at, um, especially with the uh, new developers, junior developers, they think about, you know, uh, only CRUD operations, right? Create, read, update, delete. And that's because it's REST is in their mind. Um, but we've got to think we came from a soap time, then we moved to rest, and today everything is very different. We are looking at um, not just rest type of applications. We are looking at when you're talking about um, uh, async APIs, you're talking about uh, like things like webhook, um, you're talking about protobuf, you're talking about uh, you know when you have uh, you want to have a subset of fields and from multiple resources, you're talking about GraphQL, right? So you when you think about performance, you're looking at various other options too. So you, uh, you might want event-driven architecture where you're looking at a PubSub model, or you might be working on a Fitbit, you're looking at device APIs. So you're, you've got to start thinking beyond just a, a web application and just REST APIs and CRUD. Uh, think big, um, things could change over time. We always have this idea that REST would replace SOAP and it didn't. Now we think that gRPC GraphQL could, there's, um, there's like an anti-sentiment about REST and they could replace REST, but no, they would continue to exist, right? So have this mentality in mind that you can, it is possible to go beyond REST, possible to go beyond um, CRUD and have these protocol conversations with your developers. 
Okay, uh, this is a giveaway. When I say black box, um, I'm talking about testing here. The reason I specify testing is uh, sometimes when you're working with your developers, you could end up in situations where you do not have sufficient information to help them. And uh, to give a very uh, uh, common example that I've noticed, they might come back to you saying that we are getting 500 server errors, 5x success. But when you, are, you as an API provider go back and start looking at your uh, code and your entries, you notice, I've noticed this, the response codes are, the response codes are not perfect, right? You, you have like a zillion response codes, but we default to just having 200, 500, and this is a common mistake I have seen. Take so, some time to actually look at mm -hmm. other response codes as well, right? And when it comes to network condition, you might have, especially in finance and compliance, you've got to remember like for us regulatory bodies, they actually, when they open up their APIs, they tell us how many, you know, how many retries at what frequency. So be clear as to what your retries are going to be. Have sufficient logging, in, especially in this field of finance. You, for auditing purposes, you've got to be very clear um, in case you get audited, right? And for security breaches as well. I'm sorry to interrupt. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And so I have to in interrupt you at this juncture, but thank you so much for the time that you put into this presentation and for, you know, just so much that you've elucidated for all of us. Um, thank you for your time. I would encourage you to definitely look at the chat because there were some comments coming in for you as well. So please stay and network and, and talk to other folks.